Okay, I'm going to bring up our panelists. Uh, please come and join us up here. Um, Gilberto, please come and join us. Um, we're very lucky to have here, this is a conventional thing for moderators to say, but it's really true. Um, we're discussing the future of creativity, uh, creativity online. We're discussing, discussing how people get paid, uh, authors, creators, filmmakers, musicians. And we have a group of people whose perspectives, I think, are, uh, prevent, uh, present a wonderful spectrum on that issue. Um, sitting immediately to Patrick's left, we have, Pat, uh, we have uh, Eric Hackenberg. Um, Eric, I have to say, graduated from the same law school I did, Harvard Law School. But despite that, he went on to be a very creative person. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened. It must have been some kind of mistake. I'll send a letter to the dean. Um, he is the uh, CEO of Meta Cafe. And before that was with uh, Ele uh, Electronic Arts. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit about what um, Meta Cafe is doing, particularly in terms of online video services. Uh, to his left, Eric Baptiste. Eric is uh, the Director General of CSAC, uh, which is the International uh, Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers, uh, which it sounds like a mouthful, but a, a way to visualize it is that he actually um, works with an organization which represents collectively 2.5 million creators and publishers. Um, and so he, I think, has a really interesting uh, perspective on the role of collection societies, author societies, composer societies uh, in the digital world. And finally, uh, Gilberto Gil, the Ministry, uh, Minister of Culture of Brazil, um, a great friend of Creative Commons, um, and a rock star. It, it's traditional in the, uh, particularly Silicon Valley and in the business world to refer to people as rock stars. Um, um, I, the last time I heard it, somebody was being described as a rock star, pop star, pop star. Uh, I heard someone described as a, a rock star in the world of mortgage-backed securities. So uh, I, I, I just, it's I, I interesting play, idea. I do some rock and roll too, but you do some rock just, and roll. Well, you, your style resists categorization. So um, Gilberto is an incredibly talented musician, and perhaps we may prevail on him in the very end of the session to actually give us an example of that. But he's also someone who has presided as Minister of Culture in Brazil over the question of how do we make cultural policy and how do we embrace the internet uh, in a way that will actually make um, digital creativity uh, accessible to uh, the citizens uh, of his culture. So let me start with Eric. Um, tell us about uh, the first Eric. Tell us about Metacafe. What's different about Metacafe? Is this is a, a sort of a YouTube-like site, right? Yeah, yes, you're being kind, right? It's how do, how do we build MetaCafe, an online video site, in the world of YouTube? Um, clearly, YouTube has been an incredible phenomenon culturally around the world, um, having risen to a top five site in probably maybe the shortest time of any property. Um, and, and that is our challenge. It is how do we create a site that's viable, a viable business in the YouTube world. We're fond of saying that we're one of the largest independent video sites, which independent means not YouTube. Um, <laughs> And, and really for us, when we think about that challenge, it's about how do we create a video entertainment, a short form video entertainment industry. We are exclusively focused on short form. We don't think about long form at all. We think of long form as a distribution business. We think about video entertainment, short form as a, a creative business. And everything we do, we have a panel of 80,000 of our viewers that select everything before it makes it to our homepage or into our recommendation engine. We have a producer rewards program that pays $5 for every 1,000 streams, um, so a $5 CPM. Everything that we do is about how do we help the creator be successful, both in terms of popularity and in terms of making money eventually. So the fame and fortune that's necessary for every creative endeavor. Um, and how do we filter through all of the content out there, the, the, the thousands upon thousands of videos that are uploaded to our site and even more to a site like YouTube so that we can find the ones that, uh, that have an entertainment uh, appeal. It's an interesting question because everyone says, well, what does entertainment mean? And we always think about it in the, in the broadest sense as someone who intentionally creates something not for their friends and family, that they're really trying to, 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 to attract an audience beyond their friends and family. So it's not a personal video. It's not, nothing just private to your family that you might enjoy, but nobody else would, but also with the intent, to, to create something with the intent. So you'll see Metacafe really focusing singularly on that challenge. So, so you actually reward the people whose stuff is watched the most. Right? So that's right. Give us some examples of things that have been particularly popular. Yeah, the most interesting genre that's really been created and speaks to short form video entertainment is something we call um, um, entertainment how to. It's a, it's a how to category, but it really is 
designed with entertainment in mind. So there's a, we, we recently were um, in the New York Times with this uh, fellow called Kip K, who's actually made $100,000 on our website now in the last year and a half. He's created 100 different videos for our site. Um, many of them have been very, very successful with millions of views. And when you do the math, it ends up he's made $100,000. Um, what he's done, though, is he's, he's created something where they are how-to videos, but they're not really practical or not that useful. They're just intriguing. They're entertaining. Um, how to make a, ho a homemade uh, lie detector test. How to create a, um, take the laser out of your DVD player and, such that you can actually fire it at a, a balloon and pop it, right? These, these are not <laughs> things you want to do, but they, they sort of hook you in the same way entertainment always does, which is you sort of go, why, what, do I want to see this? Well, actually kind of I do. Not for the practical reason, but for the entertainment reason. But you'll see examples like that. So in the minds of a lot of people out there, I'm sure, particularly those uh, who are not necessarily born digital, um, they listen to you saying that. And they think of the things that their colleagues or their kids have showed them online, perhaps on YouTube, which, which doesn't, does it compensate its, uh, the people who upload stuff? They there? have a program now. They have a program yeah. now. They're following your lead. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Thank you. Uh, they look at that and they say, we see the end of Western culture. Uh, we basically think, you know, uh, the, the, the equivalent of in 100 years' time, we won't be looking back at the great works of the 21st century. We'll be looking back at a lot of guys dropping Mentos into Coke cans. We'll be looking at a lot of kittens playing the piano. And they say, this is stuff that people will apparently watch. It will attract advertising. But it attracts advertising in a way that actually isn't proportional to its value as culture. It's intriguing, yes, but we're not actually rewarding artistic creativity. What's your response? Two things, really. So one thing that's unique about user-generated content is it brings something to bear that you don't see in a lot of produced content, which is it's very authentic. And I think what you're seeing partly, especially from the youth audience, is a, um, an, an appreciation of authenticity. And we try to remind advertisers in particular, when you want to talk to somebody authentically about your product, there's almost a bit, not, not a better venue for that than authentic content. But the other thing we say is, as you, as you think about the evolution of short-form video entertainment, is this is a new field where the creative energies are just being applied now, where companies are just starting to focus on it. And to, to judge an industry by its first steps is not fair to the, the eventual outcome of the industry. And we believe that short form video is going to take its stand right next to television and movies as a third pillar of video entertainment in a way that only the internet could enable, where the cost of creation and the cost of distribution empower many, many times the number of creators to start put, putting energy into it so that it will mature into something that's much, much more compelling than what we see today in the production side of it. Although the authenticity, remember, has its own real value, we believe. Mm -hmm. Now, you keep stressing the difference between short-form video and long-form video. What's the difference other than one is short and one is long? Um, the, the main difference is sort of what does the, how does the internet play its role as a disintermediate environment? Um, when you look at long form, there isn't new creative energy going into it in a fundamentally different way. There's always new people coming into it, but it's, it's people are still making 30-minute television shows or 22-minute television shows and you know 42-minute television shows. That's what they do, mm -hmm. and it's the same style, the same people, the same process that's going into it. So it's really the internet's just being used as a distribution medium. Mm -hmm. And there so we watch the same show, but we watch right. it online differently, right? right. In, in more control to the user, uh, and, and actually, if you look at the business models, they reflect that. The content distributors or you know the CBSs, ABCs of the world in the U.S. are keeping 90% and they're paying the distributors their 10%. It's almost like an affiliate, another affiliate network being built where the bulk stays with the, with the owner of the copyright. When you look at short form, it's entirely new, meaning we don't know where it's going to go. There's new energy coming in, new, new, new uh, people's creativity being applied to it. And you know, the example we look at is, is, is commercials, right? If you had told people way back when at the beginning of television that you could do something powerful and creative within 30 seconds, people would have laughed and said, that's got to be nearly impossible. But because of the necessity of it, entire agencies were created that know how to really have an impactful 30-second um, spot. You see this with the Super Bowl, where it's almost more people watching for the commercials now than the, the, the program, the, the football sporting event itself. Um, we think the same kind of energy, once the business models come into play, will, will apply to the short-form space. Hmm. So, and can you give me some examples if you're, so you're saying both this is an evolving uh, medium, so we shouldn't judge it now any more than, you know, judge a baby, and you don't know how, how the baby's going to turn out. And you're also saying that it's a, uh, something where the internet really has a completely different role. It's not just another way of getting it there, it's actually a different uh, function. If you were to place a bet, if you were to guess, when we look back in 10 years' time and we talk about the most important types of short-form videos, the ones that fit maybe more traditional artistic or political or literary or uh, cultural sort of agitation, uh, commentary, documentary, what kinds of things do you think we're going to see? 
See, I, see I, my personal belief is you, you'll actually see broader variety than you actually see in long form. Because the two minute drill, by the way, the average um, video on Meta Cafe right now is 90 seconds. We're talking extraordinarily short. When I watch a, I watch a lot of short form video. When I see one that's three minutes long, generally I'm impatient. I'm, I'm saying you, you could have cut that to, to make it 90 seconds long. So it really is the art of conveying your message in a much more compact way. I don't, I, Almost any genre, and the genres we probably haven't even thought of are going to be used in this matter because we, it ties into what we think is happening with entertainment in general, which is when you look at the youth audiences, you've heard the, the, kinds of, the concept of media snacking, um, uh, multitasking. All these things le are leading to very casual consumption of, uh, of entertainment. The idea that you can, you can hit something very quick and move on. You can hit something new and change it to something else, that you have choice all along the way. That, that consumption pattern needs a new form of entertainment, and the short form video is the casual video industry, if you will. Yeah. To me, it, there seems like a real disconnect, though, because on the one hand, you have things that are just like that, where it really is sort of the, the video equivalent of junk food. You know, it's not that I want a whole meal of this, but I, you know, I'll, I'll eat a few bites of it. But then when you think of um, other things, very, you know, sort of some of the short uh, political commercials, for example, a very powerful one for Barack Obama, uh, the um, uh, videos that try and document, let's say, um, uh, police malfeasance. Um, it seems to me that there's a real split there. One, of the, one group is just kind of like an endless series of cute little things like ad bloopers or whatever. But the other, it seems to me, is actually the democratization that we were talking about earlier, where people actually have a very powerful message, an authentic message, and they want to get it to you. Now, it's true, you may watch a lot of other things before and after that, including cats playing the piano or people dropping Mentos into Coke cans. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that that's, a, that's a, different, yet a, a different type of video. Do you see that as well? Yeah, and, and, and I would say the industry's well moved beyond the cats on skateboards type of example. I mean, this is, to us, when we hear that, we, we sort of go, yeah, okay, that was nice two years ago. That's what it was. When the, mm -hmm. I mean, that was just putting up your video camera and capturing things, which are, you see some truly amazing things that are being captured. But if you look even in the last two years, how much the industry has evolved into um, production, professional production being applied, it's already doing what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the cats on skateboard to me is one of those, we're afraid of it, we don't understand it. Um, let's, let's keep putting it down by referring to something that happened two years ago. That's my role. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, let me turn now to, to uh, Eric Baptiste. Eric, um, tell us, what does an author society, a composer society, what do they actually do? What are they for? Well, they, they, they stand for individuals. They, don't, they, don't, they mostly stand for people that compose the music, that write the lyrics, that uh, also write the, the scripts of uh, movie, t t movie, uh, uh, movies or TV series. Uh, CESA represents the whole uh, rainbow of creativity, not, not only music. They, of course, also uh, uh, collect money and distribute money on behalf of publishers. Those are corporations. But mostly, uh, the 220 societies that CESAC unites uh, look after the rights of individuals, people that uh, depend on uh, the money that is collected and distributed according to uh, usage of the works, depend on that money for a living. They, uh, in this capacity, um, they don't get paid by any, anybody else than the, uh, than the uh, author society. We don't like to call them collecting societies. We know it's a very um, uh, widespread uh, term, especially here in the UK, but we think that uh, it's a very narrow view of what a society does. A society, of course, collects money from uh, every, anybody that's, that is using uh, uh, protected, protected works, that's broadcasters, that's shops, that's restaurants, that's record companies. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be Meta Cafe. Uh, and uh, uh, we, um, our members are uh, checking uh, the, uh, the, the, the music and, and uh, the repertoire that is actually used and channeling the, uh, the, the, the collections uh, according to that usage, at least as much as possible. Also, what societies are doing, they are representing each other. It's, uh, it's a model that has uh, been incredibly successful in providing blanket uh, coverage for the, for the, uh, uh, for the, for the creators. Uh, a, a creator in the UK is represented not only here in the UK by a UK society, but depending on the repertoire for music, for example, probably close to 100 of CISAC members around the world that are collecting the money uh, and channeling it to, uh, for music here, the PRS and CPS Alliance, which in turn distributes it to, to, the, to the members. Societies also do provide some kind of service they, to, to the users of, uh, of, of, of music and other creative works. They're not 
been established for that reason. They've been established um, as a way to protect creators, to, 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 to protect the value of, of the works. But they uh, are, I believe, very useful for users of uh, creative works because they provide a rather simple way to, to, clear the, to clear the rights. When I say simple way, I know, I'm aware that there are some criticisms. Uh, it's, it's not always a very simple process, especially when, you, when you're dealing with new services. You have to establish the rules of the game first, you, and then you have to establish a value of the repertoire, hence the price. But if you're able to deliver um, 17 million works of music, like the ones that we have identified in our uh, database, to a radio station, and uh, you don't have, when you're a radio station, or even if you're an internet website, uh, to, to wonder whether that, that, that song uh, is cleared and you can use it or not. Uh, we think it's a tremendous, tremendous service. And, and, the, and the value of the, of the society's traditional license is something that is uh, not realized, not recognized enough, I think. So, so that, and certainly that's the traditional justification um, that this is simply solves a problem of transaction costs, which otherwise would be insoluble. That uh, otherwise, how do I possibly, I can't go to each individual, uh, I'll go and make a deal with Madonna, I want to play her first, then I want to pay the police, I'll go and make a deal with them, and then perhaps I want someone reading some poetry, I'll go and make a deal with him. And the collection society makes that possible, reduces transaction costs. Now, of course, the internet is said to re reduce transaction costs, and it's said that it's quite possible that the internet allows more efficient forms of negotiation and uh, transactions than would have been possible beforehand. Do you see it as a threat to uh, the author societies, to CZAC, or do you see it as something which you actually can manage to turn to uh, the advantage of authors and composers? Uh, we, we, see, we see the internet as a fantastic opportunity, but it's a, it's a, it's a very big transformation of all the, all the businesses that rely on, on creativity and creative works. So we are currently in, the, in this uh, difficult time where the uh, dangers, the uncertainties uh, are, do are dominant, but uh, ultimately, I agree with your introduction, uh, there, there, there's bound to be benefits for, for, for creators. Uh, in, the, in the past, it used to be much more difficult for uh, anyone to, to, to get music from, from your uh, different countries. It was mm -hmm. expensive to ship CDs all, all around the world. You had some certain thresholds that you had to take into account before you decided as a record company or as a, as a, as a, as a studio for DVDs whether you wanted to ship that to Malaysia or to, or to, or to Brazil. Uh, the internet has to uh, help uh, global cultural expressions find a wider audience. We also, we also believe that somebody has to take care of the, uh, of the intermediation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not because you have some, th theoretically some tools to track uh, your, the, the use of your content online, that as a creator you want to do this. Uh, somebody has to do it, an organization has to do it. It might be uh, an organization set up just for that. It might be tr other uh, segments of the, of the creative industries. But we believe that uh, societies have been uh, providing vital services to, to, to creators uh, for, for, for close to a century or more mm -hmm. than a century in some, some countries. And by adapting to, the, to, this, to this environment, an environment that is also very challenging because everybody here in this room is probably familiar with the long tail. It's fantastic, it's great, you can, you can access anything you want on the internet, but how do you, how do you track uh, the use of so many, so many million works that don't attract a, a lot of uh, business? Mm -hmm. uh, a penny here, a dime there. Um, how do you calculate the amounts that, it, that has to, to go to this Eric as opposed to it, this Eric? Um, it's, a, it's a huge uh, organiza organizational challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a huge computational challenge. And we've been organizing ourselves to deal with it. Uh, 17 million musical works now have a um, unique identifier, the International Standard uh, Work Code, ISWC. Half a million audiovisual uh, works also have such an identifier, the ISAN, the International mm -hmm. Audiovisual Standard Number. Those 2.5 million people that our societies are representing have a unique identifier, the IPI number, and, and there are other things and standard messages, also um, an initiative that we launched together with the, the recording industry with the FPI and, and RAAA 
five, six years ago, called MI3P at the time, now DDEX, mm -hmm. to, to, to streamline the exchange of messages between record companies, societies, and digital service pr providers. All those things, uh, we believe, uh, those investments uh, will enable societies to uh, not only remain uh, vital intermediaries in the, in, in, in the cultural industries, but probably uh, provide new services, extra services to their primary <coughs> Uh, stakeholders, the uh, authors and composers and the publishers, but probably also help some other segments of the creative industries achieve their visions and realize their dreams. So how granular, that is my last question I think for you, how granular, how tightly, how atomic level control do you want on the world of the internet? I mean, there's, there's two possible visions here. One is, as one person from a, I won't, I won't name names to protect the guilty, but as one person who represented an industry group once said to me, I said, well, come on, there's always been uses of music that have been uncompensated, unmonetized, uncontrolled. If I sing a song in the shower, um, you know, it's not a public performance, and you should be very glad that it's not a public performance. Um, I'm paying Patrick uh, for, this, for the song. Um, and uh, he said, well, that's just a matter of better monitoring technology. Um, you know, when we know, when we, right, you know, so one, one vision of the internet is it's the panopticon, right? And that we track every use. So when somebody inserts just a tiny fragment uh, of a song in, um, in Eric Hackenberg's, uh, in a video on Eric Hackenberg's site. It's up, ah, there you go, that's gonna be paid. Now that's one vision. Another vision is we ought to actually have some minimum level where we say this is private, non-commercial creativity using little fragments of culture. It's fair use to use the copyright jargon or fair dealing. And that we should just stay away from. We should let users do this. We should let them create because we're not about controlling every tiny bit of culture. We're not out to say, oh, you soloed in jazz and you quoted another song, you should be paying. Instead, we should leave a realm of free space. What do you say to that? I say to this that uh, author societies are business model agnostic. We don't, we, we don't care, they don't care how, uh, grand, uh, how the, 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 um, uh, the money is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what is important is that any, any commercial use of music uh, or other creative, creative works uh, is compensated. It does not mean that you have to control uh, what you, I, I don't, my members don't have to control what you access, what you see, what you watch, what you listen to. Uh, there are other ways, uh, more approaches like the traditional blanket license. You get a license for the whole repertoire that our members represent, um, and in turn, you, you're, you feel free to uh, make available to your audience, might be a traditional audience or a more, less traditional audience, uh, the, 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 those works. And the societies get paid uh, on, on a uh, percentage of revenue or mm -hmm. other schemes um, by this uh, licensee. What we need in order to be, to be fair uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and channel the, the right amounts to the right people is some kind of um, uh, estimate of what has been what has been viewed or listened to and how many times, mm -hmm. uh, but it it doesn't need to be tracked to you. Uh, we we need we need to we need to reward because that's the law. We need to reward the people that whose works are used more, yeah. uh, and th and that we need to do this. And and those tools that I described, those uh, uh, identifiers, the acronyms. Mm -hmm. Uh, we think will help us achieve that. Uh, something that is seamless, that is non-intrusive, that does not mean that, we need, that, that, that there is a need for control, but a, a need for monetization of each commercial use. And uh, one of the promises of the internet is that there should be more uh, mm -hmm. business for everybody. But the authors and composers the, and publishers should not be the ones that are, that are losing out. They should, be, they should be in the mix, right. and they should, they, should, they should have their share yeah. of, of that revenue. Well, I want to turn to, uh, thank you very much. I want to turn to Gilberto Gilles now, because he has a unique perspective, both as an artist and someone who actually is selling albums, could be selling albums, could be touring, but also someone who's had to de define cultural policy uh, in Brazil and has his own thoughts on it. Gilberto, do you want to share our, your remarks with us? Oh, yeah. Should I go there? As or you wish. As you... Okay, I'll go there. Thank you. Okay. Oh, good afternoon. First of all, let me thank you all, the organizers of this event, you know, for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and an opportunity to be here. I'm going to talk on behalf of my uh, governmental standpoint, you know as a person, uh, of course, but also as a public manager, 
that I am now as a Minister of Culture of Brazil. Since 2003, when I took office as a Minister of Culture of Brazil, we have been looking into digital technologies as cultural phenomena. We at the Ministry have insisted on the strategic role of culture in policy making. This has obliged us to change radically the way to conceive of politics, state, society, especially in relation to digital technology. In politics, and especially in governments, radical changes are only possible at a specific historical moment. Through the insertion of culture and cultural diversity as a policy-making device in the political and managerial governmental equation, we offer society the opportunity to achieve radical change step by step using the day-to-day -day inputs of new industrial and social technologies without the earthquakes of classical revolutionary action. If we look at the new digital possibilities, we could easily conclude that they bring a built-in revolutionary device in themselves. Digital culture initiatives can play a fundamental role in shaking away the inertia of the traditional polit politics that has secluded society from public life, generating a vacuum of critical political thinking and even producing cynicism especially in, gov in governmental sectors. We need to acknowledge that traditional politics is failing in advancing democracy and social development. The conversion of the digital technologies has created around the internet a totally peaceful revolution, a bottom-up unrest happening everywhere which I see as a very positive sign of the rising of a non-governmental political movement that I believe to be a direct and major result of cultural and counter-cultural movements of our most recent history in their increasing power to influence public policies. In the rise of a peer-to-peer -peer culture, for example, peer C. <laughs> what I see in Brazil and in many countries, is that new contemporary political movements don't come from traditional politics. They don't depend totally on representative democracy anymore. On the contrary, they operate outside the electoral system and influence it to some degree. People are more and more eager to engage in politics in a new and proactive way. It seems to me that this collective unrest can only be met by governments if they really understand the cultural diversity issue and peer-to-peer -peer actions and its implications in the new model of development for the 21st century. The 21st century technologies represent a huge challenge to regulations. The revolution generated by the convergence of digital technologies obliges us to reinvent the way we do almost everything. I believe that anybody with public responsibility should look into the digital distribution of intellectual property as the most direct and powerful way of democratizing knowledge in the history of mankind. But instead, we see almost every formal institution insisting on bluntly calling the digital distribution piracy. We should rather be looking at new business models and into a burst of freshness in the political regulatory analysis. The work I have witnessed with the idea and practice of digital culture in the Ministry of Brazil, Minister, Cultural Minister of Brazil, shows us that it's possible to have another form of consonance somehow radical I would even say a symbiosis of the state with the civil society. Many corporations and governments all over the world have positioned themselves conservatively 
and are trying to block the advance of these digital new possibilities. Every technical revolution creates a reaction like that. Digital distribution of intellectual property, if seen from the analogical perspective, represent, represents a threat to business, a security problem, and a loss of social control. These perceptions are but momentary setbacks which shall soon be resolved. However, we must be ever vigilant as digital technology, like any other technology, can be used against individuals and society's interests. That's why I'm sure we have not only to humanize, but also politicize these technologies, which means thoroughly discuss them and make them available to society and every citizen. Regulations should be there to ensure freedom and open access to, to knowledge, not just for business as usual purposes. I want to quote my friend Lawrence Lassig, a great contemporary thinker and activist, in his book Code 2.0. He points out to the necessity of new forms of regulation to guarantee the new forms of freedom and human connectivity. Lessing defends the necessity of the presence of the state to guarantee that the internet service, that the internet, pardon, that the internet survives into maturity with its radical social innovation potential fully in place. For that, he points out, we have to discuss a new political understanding of governance. That if we want to guarantee the collective and emancipating existence of cyberspace, we need to come up with a brand new regulatory framework of thoughts. Otherwise, these libertarian possibilities created by digital technologies will be amputed. We have brought digital multimedia studios and access to the internet peer-to-peer -to -peer tools to about 700 grassroots communities all over Brazil. We are making them, by the end of the year, they were gonna be 1,500, and by, in two years, they, they're gonna be 5,000 or even 10,000 if, if the government guarantees the means and the society, you know, help us to sort of broad the, 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 the process of distributing those, those hotspots. Today in Brazil, we have traditional communities recording and publishing in the internet their songs or videotaping their work and culture. This burst of fresh air is unchaining new vital ideas, new innovative productions, generating a real empowerment process of an emerging creative society. This process is encouraging and inducing the formation of a network of new cultural multimedia producers in Brazil, a network which will soon be consolidated into a new generation of authors and artists. This experience with digital technologies in the Pontos de Cultura, the cultural hotspots, made possible a symbolic exercise a dialogue between social, cultural, grassroots communities with digital new concepts and contemporary languages. This very rich process begins when the communities, the new cultural producers, start networking and, by doing so, engage in a process of autonomy, free from government or any other control. The transformation starts when the kids in the communities recognize the digital technological devices as cultural performance tools, cultural and political performance tools, as a source of diversified references, as a platform for aesthetic creation and re-symbolization of their experiences. In other words, social change starts when they understand cyberspace as a territory of their own, when they understand uploading before they ever heard of downloading, when they start publishing. This is the exact moment when empowerment takes place. Sheer magic, maybe. Action, life.
you know, work, politics, technology, all together. I want to invite you all to come to Brazil next year to discuss these issues with us. We will be joining efforts with many institutions, both governmental and from civil society, as well as companies to thoroughly look into the perspectives of these new digital realities. Thank you. I'm going to ask one question of Gilberto, and then um, feel f then I'm going to ask uh, questions from the audience. So just as Krista did, please, please prepare your questions in advance and, and come up to the mic. Gilberto, we talked about this a while ago, I think, in New York. But one of the things that you said that you think makes Brazil really um, sympa, sim sympathique for the, the internet is that it, Brazil is a remix culture itself. Brazil is a mixture of races. It's a mixture of ethnicities. It's a mixture of musical styles. Brazilian culture itself is <laughs> borrowing, taking, assembling all kinds of things and everything from the music to the food to the, to the people themselves. And you said that that, that kind of creativity uh, is a creativity which can be hampered, limited, if we try and control every last tiny bit, if we, would, if we try and say, no, I own this bit, you own that bit, that this is not how we actually create. So as you look forward and you look at the practical examples that you were talking about, what kinds of sort of integrating creativity do you see that has been enabled by these initiatives that you've done, these 700 uh, types of initiatives? What kinds of new creative music or new creative projects do you see um, that people are actually uh, using this technology to, to put forward? I see lots of things. I mean, like uh, creators, uh, uh, musicians, authors, um, um, uh, playwriters and things. I mean, they are using the, the new possibilities uh, made pos no? yeah. okay. possible by the internet and by the peer-to-peer -peer culture and by the, the reassembling processes that we have today and uh, the sharing and all, all of that. I mean, we have many examples in Brazil of people, artists, for instance, that uh, were never able to, to match, you know, to, to, to get a, an audience mm -hmm. in Brazil before eternally fighting for a small opportunity by a record company or whatever. And, and, and then all of a sudden they had the internet possibilities, you know, to post their uh, work and, and share their work, you know, with Europe and Asia and America and everything. And they got an opportunity. We have at least uh, three or four new cases of uh, artists that were absolutely unknown in Brazil that started, you know, sharing their mm -hmm. Uh, songs through the internet with Spain and Holland and places, and they they got an they they've got an audience now, yeah. they've got a market, a new market for them, they, they they've got new followers. They are also doing a very contributive cultural work by spreading Brazilian culture by, by spreading Portuguese uh, <laughs> written stuff, you know, Portuguese language stuff, you know, to 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 countries mm -hmm. that would never, would never have it otherwise. Uh, many, 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 ah, I would be here yes. coaching and coaching <laughs> and coaching and coaching. So that, that's why I think we think that we have to seriously uh, consider the fact that the internet is it's putting all, us, all of us into a sort of a new challenge. You know, the record companies, the authors, the, 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 the societies, collective rights societies, the public, uh, ev ev all of us. I mean, it's a, it's a new <coughs> challenging moment and we, we have to face it. 